in normal times, and I don't know when that will be, uh, we run about seven events every month. So that's sort of usually Friday night dinners, festivals, um, you know, all kinds of social action, all kinds of great things. So I'm really, really pleased that uh, Daisy and I and Niran and B could all uh, come together again to run another event so everyone could hear the story and ask questions and enjoy. So um, just to say, my name is Bea Lefkowitz. I'm the director of Sephardi Voices UK. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to our first Zoom Sephardi Voices Sharing Our Story event in conjunction with Moishi House. So thank you, Moishi House for providing us with this opportunity. And thank you, Niran, for agreeing to be live interviewed and answer questions. And I should say the second times, this time virtually, last time in November, we did it with the lunch. So it's going to be interesting. So the plan for tonight is, um, I'll tell you a little bit about Safadi Voices UK, and then my colleague Daisy Aboudi will ask Niran some questions. You will also have the opportunity to ask questions at the end. So, Safadi Voices UK is an oral history archive of video testimonies. We started interviewing in 2009, and we wanted to tell the often forgotten stories of the Jews from the Middle East, North Africa, and Iran who settled in Britain. We have now collected more than 100 interviews, and we're grateful to the many interviewees who've shared their memories of growing up in places like Tangiers, Baghdad, Casablanca, Alexandria, Esfahan, Beirut, Benghazi, Wat Medani, or Tehran. They also shared their memories of leaving their homes, sometimes under difficult circumstances, and memories of going to new places, building up new communities, and forming new identities. Please go to our website, www.safadivoices.org.uk, to find out more. The entire interview collection is accessible here in London at the British Library, and soon will be also accessible at Betat Futsot in Israel, for those people who are listening in Israel. Um, um, but we've also made a number of films and excerpts of interviews, which you can see online. We've recently made a film with uh, the musicologist Yeheskel Kojeman, uh, which you can see, uh, we've produced a film on Pesach, uh, which had lots of viewings, and very recently Daisy uh, made a film on, uh, uh, on identity and the question, uh, how do people identify? And it's, uh, I hope you can see that, and it's, it's really interesting. So please contact us if you're interested in specific interviews, which we can make accessible, and also if you'd like to be interviewed. You may wonder how we can continue to interview in these corona times, but we're piloting remote interviews through Zoom uh, next week, and we're going to conduct our first interview next week. So we hope it will be successful and meaningful to the interviewee and to the interviewer. Um, but we've also been thinking of all our interviewees over the last weeks and are hoping that they're healthy and have the right support, even if they're separated from children and grandchildren. So without further ado, let me hand you over to Daisy Aboudi, who is the Deputy Director of Safari Voices UK, and who's going to introduce you to our speaker tonight, Niran Basun Timan. Thank you. Thank you, Niran, for agreeing uh, to, to be part of this, our first Zoom um, event, as Bea says. Um, we're, I'm going to ask Niran some questions, um, kind of guide her in her storytelling of her life and, and some of the amazing work that she's doing now. And then uh, I'll open it up to questions to all of you. So, Niran, hello. Hi. How are you? I'm okay. Lovely. Keeping busy. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with a quote from your interview. Um, and I'm going to ask you if you can maybe just elaborate it, upon it, on it a little bit more. It's a, and it's about okay. identity. As I was making this identity film and it was quite powerful what you said. Um, you said, I always present myself as an Iraqi Jew. Always. Iraqi, Jew, British citizen, but it's always Iraqi Jew. I can't be a Jew without being Iraqi and I can't be Iraqi without being a Jew. It goes together. And I was just uh, wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that and the way the identity, uh, your Iraqi and your Jewish identity come together and why you think Iraq has played such a, an important role in your 
the way you are, you see yourself? Well, I, I think I think the history of Jews go really far, far, far into the history of Iraq. So um, I, I feel that I am part of the exodus of Jerusalem into Babylon. This is what I feel. I hope I haven't done my DNA because I don't want to discover that I'm not. So for me, I'm Iraqi. That's it. My history is Babylon. I sometimes describe myself as a Babylonian. And for me, it combines Iraq and Jews together. So uh, it is very important for me. Judaism is very, very important. It's, it's, it's part of me. I can't be not, I can't be Iraqi without being a Jew. And being a Jew without Iraqi as well, it, it, this is me. I, I mean, it's very difficult to, to explain. It's just like saying, you know, uh, can you have one ear without the other? No, I can't. They, they are really connected to each other and I cannot separate them. Uh, and, and I'm proud of both of them, really, to be honest with you. When you could, maybe actually for everyone to start off with, um, could you tell us a little bit about growing up in Iraq, the, the time period that we're talking about and uh, maybe some memories that you have of your childhood? Sure. Um, I was born in Iraq in, uh, I'm, I'm going to give my age, 1957. Uh, and um, I cannot remember, I was too young when the first revolution happened. Um, well, it's not a revolution, it's a coup. It's not a revolution. There was no revolution in Iran, it's only coups. Um, so the first coup when they toppled the um, uh, kingdom, uh, I was one year old, so I wouldn't remember anything. But uh, what I remember, I can vaguely remember 1963 when the other coup against the, the first president of Iraq. I remember that very vaguely because my father worked as a journalist and he was involved with the, um, he was a, a sort of a, a deputy chief editor in some newspapers, which were the uh, sort of governmental uh, newspapers. So um, my dad was, um, even before that, there was a um, um, sort of, they tried to assassinate the president. Uh, and my dad was taken to prison because they thought that's it. They toppled Abdul Karim Qasim and he will be, you know, that's it, will be finished. Uh, I can't remember this, but I know about it. But 1963, when the coup against Abdul Karim Qasim happened, I remember that very, 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 very uh, vividly because we left our house and we went for three days staying with my uncle because we were worried that they will come again and take my dad. So we just literally closed the door and, and went to my uncle for three days until things settled. Uh, but this is, you know, vague. As a child, you know, you're going to sleep at your uncle's house, like sleepover, it's fun. We didn't know what's behind it. Um, 1967, and my childhood was a normal childhood, you know, going to school, having fun with my friends, um, you know, the community was quite small, but you know, as a child, you don't, you see your, your friends in, in school. And we had an uncle and his children, so that's it, you know, we didn't need more than that. 1967 changed all my life when the Six Days War started. Suddenly I felt that I'm different than the rest, than the rest of, you know, the Iraqis because uh, fear entered into our lives. Um, I suddenly saw my parents trying to listen to, um, you know, uh, the radio and trying to get information and, and you know, it's it's unpleasant period. Um, the, the only the only uh, way they can get uh, proper news is was listening to the Israeli uh, broadcast in Arabic, but to do this in Iraq you have to be very very careful. So it was like this: it was closing the curtains just in case somebody will see on the radio which 
wave you are getting and which number and which is and put it very very low and literally listening to see what what's new because in the beginning i don't know if if the um if everyone here uh, knows in the beginning in 1967 uh, the news came out from the arab uh, media saying you know they they nearly finishing israel and and we knew that if Might israel is finished yeah, just to stop you, I think maybe we need to go back a bit and explain some background to, to all of this. Um, yeah. So just to explain the Six Day War in, 1960, in 1967 um, was a war with a lot of Arab nations against Israel in the summer of 1967. Uh, and it affected Jewish populations all around the Middle East. Just to give everyone a little bit of um, background to that. Yeah. Um, and now just continue. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, the news that came out, came out in the Arab uh, media is they finished Israel, they killed everyone, they bombed everything. And we knew that that's it. It's, it's the end of us because, you know, they're going to, they're gonna you know feel that uh, they are strong they're gonna really uh, hurt us but as well when we discovered that actually israel did not lose the anger came on us so we were losers whatever whatever happens we are, there's no you know lose lose situation so the governments of the arab countries who participated or even not participated took the revenge of the failure in the war on the Jews, on the Jewish populations in each country. I mean, in Libya, I know, I know in, um, you know, um, um, some of uh, people who ever left after, uh, in Egypt, in other countries, they took the revenge on the Jews. It coincided with the coup that happened in 68, when the Ba'ath party came to power. Um, again, to show their power, they tried to, uh, you know, to take the most vulnerable uh, group in Iraq and use them as a scapegoat. How did so, it impact you on a personal level? You said that, that that was a point when your life changed. Could you give us some examples maybe of how it affected yeah. you and your family? I mean, I mean, personally, as a child of 10, I discovered that I am different, that I'm a Jew, I mean, we were raised at home that, you know, we were not raised at, look, you are a Jew and these are Muslims. We were raised that we are Iraqis. You know, religion wasn't part of it. We went to a, although we went to Jewish schools, but we had, you know, Muslim and Christian friends who came, you know, who, who studied with us. And we had neighbors and we had friends from my, my father's, you know, um, from work and all this. Um, then I discovered that I am different. I am a Jew who is a minority, who needs to be very careful, um, you know, not to, obviously, not to show, not to go on, you know, be careful to show that you're Jewish. Um, the, and, and then from on, from that on, it just like sort of grow, growing very quickly uh, from, you know, just sort of losing your childhood. You can't really be a child. You have to be very careful. You have to, you have to learn how to be careful. To be honest with you, personally and my family, we did not, we didn't have any experience of being attacked and nobody attacked us in the street. Nobody, um, you know, said any, uh, no verbal abuse or anything, but you could feel it in the air. So um, towards the end of 1968, a um, uh, few people were arrested, uh, men were arrested. And uh, in January uh, 1969, uh, there was a sort of um, uh, court hearing accusing the the jews of being um spies for israel with the full story of you know they did this they did that they bombed the um 
Um, they had uh, sort of machines to give uh, messages uh, to Israel and trying to, to do some uh, uh, terrorist activity and all this. And um, nine Jews were hanged uh, on the 27th of January. Uh, in, the, in the main public square in Baghdad, uh, that, that was a shock really to the, to the community. Uh, you see it on, on, on the screen and you see people hanged and um, uh, the question will say, you know, you start questioning yourself who is going to be next. Um, father had been arrested. You said your father had been arrested before that. Yes. You, you know what that was for why what happened and because he was a journalist, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about his work. Yeah, it, it, it had nothing to do with him being Jew. It was because he worked for the uh, sort of the uh, newspaper which was uh, writing on behalf of the government. So when they topple the, the president or the whole uh, um, uh, government, anyone who spoke on behalf of the government will be taken as well. So it, it had nothing to do with being a Jew. So, uh, and I personally, I can't remember because I was too young. Did uh, you need to be a journalist after that? Sorry, uh, he stopped in 1963 when, when the first, when the first coup, well, well the second coup, um, because it became dangerous, you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, people who, who did the coup were more violent. And by this time, he had three kids and a family and all this. So he decided that he's not going, going to work with the, in, the new, in, the, um, you know, in journalism anymore. But he did at a later stage, but nothing to do because he was political. And at a later stage, he was doing like sort of, um, you know, articles about literature and about other things, you know, no, no uh, politics. You mentioned in your interview that uh, he wrote a book. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, uh, my dad, while he was working with the government, one of the uh, most important uh, poet, poet in the Arab world um, in, in the last century was uh, somebody called Muhammad Mahdi Jawahari. Um, he was although he was a, a poet, but he was, as well, he was a, a chief editor in the newspapers of Abdul Karim Qasim, where my father worked. So they, they, had, they, they became friends to the extent that uh, Muhammad Mahdi Jawahari, when he wasn't in the mood of writing the main article of the newspaper, my dad used to write the, the article, and he was happy with that, Jawahari that my dad would write it on his behalf in Al Jawahiri's name. So they became very good friends. With time, and when Saddam came and uh, they had some arguments, uh, Saddam and, uh, and uh, Jawahiri, Sadd uh, Saddam decided to exile Al Jawahiri. And he lived for a while, I think in Prague. Uh, then, um, let me just switch off the WhatsApp here. Um, yeah, and then um, uh, in 72 or 73, he was allowed to return to Jawahari. So my dad took this opportunity and obviously going to see him and say, you know, you know, to meet up again. He decided to uh, sit with him and ask him questions and write a book. It's sort of a dialogue between him and Al Jawahari. And at that time, that was in 73. At that time, uh, Jawahari had written his will by hand and he gave it to my dad. At a later stage, he changed it, but he gave it to my dad and, and that will is, is, is in the book. My dad finished the book, finished writing the book uh, in uh, July, 1973. At that time, my sister, uh, my brother has already, had already left Iraq. And my sister and I left as well. So the, um, there was um, an offer given to my dad that the, um, 
culture uh, office in Iraq will print his book. Um, that that thought that if he will if his book will be printed, he will have the excuse to stay in Iraq while all his children are out. So he refused the offer, took the book written with his handwriting uh, on an A4 pages. He had beautiful writing. Um, and he, when he, he took it to, with him to Israel, the manuscript was with him for years. He tried to print it in Israel. There is an organization, association in Israel called the Association of Academics from, um, uh, from Iraq, were not interested really to print it. And I understand nobody would be interested in such a, you know, it's not a memoir, it's not this, it's a specific, specific book. So the book stayed for uh, till 1973. Um, it stayed as a, as a manuscript. Uh, I have a friend, I hope it's not had, I hope it still have, because um, we don't know if he's alive or not yet. He was kidnapped uh, recently. Uh, my friend uh, Mazen Latif um, uh, was given uh, a project, uh, sorry, 19, uh, 2013, Baghdad was chosen to be the uh, capital of culture of the Arab world. And within that, budget was set for things to be done in this year, print books, to uh, make films, to do other cultural things. And Mazel Latif, my friend, was offered to print, I can't remember if it was 20 or so books. So he knew about my dad's book. He contacted me, he said, look, we've got an opportunity. Why don't we print the book? So my mom who was in her late 70s, early 60s, uh, early 80s, um, decided to type everything on the computer because you need to give it you know, you can't send the manuscript. It will take longer. So she typed everything herself and my sister and my brother helped her to type the poems. The poems in Arabic go into a block of the first part and the second part. And it goes then another line and another line. And it has to finish and it has to end at the same um, um, sort of level. So they all work together and we send the book uh, by PDF to Baghdad, and it was printed. The, the, you know, if you think about it, he finished it in 1973 in Baghdad, took it with him to Israel. He passed away, meanwhile, he passed away in, 19, uh, in 1995. And the book was returned back to Iraq to be printed exactly where he wanted it to be printed in 2013. So if you calculate, is the 40 years of the wonder, the um, the wandering of the Jews in Sinai, it's all connected. It's just like the book just disappeared, you know, wandered and, and, you know, got lost for 40 years. And then it was published in Iraq. And, and actually the dedication of the book is, um, I've got it here, is the, uh, it, it is to the Iraqi people. That's the dedication of the book. Now I am in the office, I've got a studio. I, I turned my garage into my office where I uh, run my forum, which I will talk about it later. And I sell books. So I've got the books. If you just give me one moment, I'll bring them. Um, just while we wait for Niran, if you do want to ask questions, you can either message me privately or you can message the whole group if you want everyone to see it. And then you want me the to end, bring the book? I don't have a copy here. I can bring a book from upstairs. Maybe at the end we'll... Yeah, we'll sure, no problem. I can show you my library as well. Perfect. You can take us on a tour. <laughs> yeah. Um, your dad, um, obviously he wrote the book in, uh, in Iraqi Arabic. Could you uh, tell well, us Arabic? No, Arabic, Arabic. Uh, classical Arabic. Classical. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit about the difference between Iraqi Arabic, Judeo Arabic, and what you spoke at home, and what that kind of meant? Okay. The classical Arabic is the Arabic that used 
um, you know, for for um, it all all over the Arab country. There is no difference. Okay. Then it goes. It's not language. It's dialect. Each country has their its own dialect. It's if you compare it, I can't even compare it to to uh, American and English. Um, it's. I mean, I can understand most of the uh, dialect. Apart, thank you very much, Sami. That's the book. Sami has showing the book. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, uh, and Nahla, and Nahla has the book. Yeah. <laughs> you saved me going upstairs. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh yeah so the uh, classical arabic is used in all over the arab country okay it's the is the language that is used in quran for example uh the dialects are different it's um again i'm trying to find the the difference it's not like american and english it's not like french french in france and and canadian it's more it's it's more different um i mean i can understand egyptian i can understand uh, um um lebanese syrian palestinians but for example moroccan it will be difficult for me or algerian will be difficult for me they are dialects now in iraq there are dialects uh jewish dialect uh, um, you know um Arab, Arabic, Judeo-Arabic uh, uh, dialect, and there is uh, the other dialect that is used by everyone else, sort of. But we used to call it the dialect of Islam, not Islam. Islam is the religion. Islam is the people who are Muslims. So we used to call it Lahjat al-Islam, which is the dialect of the Muslims. We at home we use the muslim dialect we were taught the muslim dialect because my pair my father because of you know being in um, you know in contact with a lot of non-jewish people he did they wanted us to learn this dialect as well so we spoke the muslim dialect more than the jewish dialect so that's the difference and and and, and in iraq there is a uh, the north of Iraq, there is a there's a city called Mosul. Uh, their dialect is very very close to the Jewish dialect. So uh, when I speak in the Jewish dialect, a lot of people say, "Are oh, you Muslawi?" I'm not Muslawi. It's the all the Jews in 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 the whole of Iraq use the same dialect. Uh, and there are other cities. I just discovered recently that Tikrit. Where Saddam Hussein comes from or came from, speak very similar dialect to the Judeo Arabic dialect. Was it quite um, common for Jewish people to speak the mainstream Muslim dialect, or was that quite unusual? Well, no, no, it's not unusual. If you are in contact with Muslim people, yes, you, you at speak home, Muslim. Uh, at home, no, it wasn't, as far as I know um no i would say no Bec because few of my friends could not speak the muslim dialect it was very difficult for them you know for example we don't say uh, uh, the jewish dialect we don't say ch in the muslim dialect you say ch in the jewish dialect you say k so they used to mix with between things not every curtain turns into ch so it's it's and, and they, they used to make a lot of mistakes if they speak. So not everyone, no. And um, your, you said your uh, parents left in 1973. What year did you leave Iraq? 1973 as well. I left in April 1973 and my parents left in, uh, in uh, August 1973. But when we left, and my brother left in January 1972. Now, when my brother left, he left to the UK uh he came to the uk um uh, we did not know whether we're gonna see him again or not so each part each part of our family that left did not know if they're gonna see the remaining part in iraq so when when 
my brother left. He didn't know if he's going to see us again or we're going to see him again. When we left, my sister and I in 73, we did not know we we're going to see our parents again. But we might see our brother because he was in, in, in London. And uh, sorry, in, he was in Manchester. He was in the UK. So it was sort of uh, installments until we all reunited. And um, your parents left, well, and you left quite late in terms of um, Jews leaving Iraq. Can you yeah. tell us a bit about why and what happened and, and the process of leaving? Okay. Um, the majority of the Jews, uh, the sort of the mass uh, immigration of the Jews from Iraq was in 1950-51. Um, but my father feeling, again, Iraqi. He thought, no, everything will be okay. I'm going to stay here. He felt, he felt too Iraqi to leave Iraq. Um, and, you know, uh, things go up and down in, 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 uh, in Iraq, went up and down. So, you know, sometimes it's very bad, sometimes it's very good. But, you know, even, even after that, it will be okay. And this is what my, my father um, thought. So we stayed in Iraq. Uh, after all my family from my mother's side and my father's side left. We had only one uncle and we had one, um, my mom's cousin and his family. That's it. We didn't have anyone else. Um, they all left to Israel. And um, in 19, um, after the um, hanging, in 1969, people started thinking that that's it, you know, we're just kidding ourselves, you know, we need to get out. But the, it wasn't possible to leave because we as Jews were not allowed to carry a passport. So people started escaping through the border, through the through Kurdistan, through the north, finding routes. Um, there were few routes through people, through smugglers. Uh, and uh, um, the majority arrived to Israel, and uh, at a later stage, uh, I think end of, if I'm not mistaken, like 71, they allowed the Jews to, to apply for passport, and it goes into, you have to apply and you have to get a permission from the um, interior office and then from, from the um, sort of the police uh, until you can up, get the passport and literally print the passport and take it. So people started, so the, then the escape routes finished and people started applying to go to, you know, to use the passport and leaving. Um, when my, my brother finished his uh, um, um, bachelor degree in the University of Baghdad, uh, and towards the end of his studies, he taught um, chemistry in the Jewish school. But that wasn't what he wanted. He wanted, he wanted life. So he applied for a scholarship to uh, Manchester University. I think it was called something else something polytechnic or something uh, and he got a scholarship to go so uh, he we up, and before that before sorry before they gave the permission for the Jews to leave with a passport my father my brother decided that's it he said to my parents he said look I have no future here I have to leave like the rest especially when his friends every day another friend leaves and suddenly he you know he disappears and they know that he left so um, it was very difficult for my parents to accept that my brother will escape. I think mentally they couldn't take it, especially for my dad, uh, that, you know, my son is escaping from Iraq. It's contradicting his feeling as Iraqi. You know, if you're leaving, you're leaving with a passport like anyone else. Why do you need to escape? This is my, this is my conclusion, but I mean, I didn't hear it from my dad. Uh, and um, so my dad, so my brother, uh, uh, so he, he said to them, that's it, I need to leave. I remember it, I remember it very, very well. You know, when you leave through the borders, you have to have only a small, you don't take suitcases, you take small um, hand luggage to have 
you know, underwear and to have a couple of socks and to have something or just, just to last you for a few days. And I remember my mom used to say, okay, I'll pre- okay, okay, I'll prepare the bag for you. So she used to go and put two vests and leave it. And then the next day she'll take one vest and she will put two pants. And then the other day she will take one pant and she'll put two socks. It was very difficult her to prepare that bag. So um, then they allowed to, uh, to have passport and he left with a passport then that was okay, all right, he's, he's older, he can go, you know, and, and start his life and all this. We, my sister and I, we were underage. I was nearly 16, she was nearly 17. How can we go without our parents? It's, it's you know, it's unheard of. In, in Iraq, we used to be uh, registered on your parents' passport. So, um, you know, my my brother um obviously with a very uh, careful carefully uh, writing letters to my parents that uh, you know to encourage them to to leave iraq and you know for them they accepted that their son just left iraq and he's starting his own life and all this so he decided actually to put pressure on them so he wrote them a letter and he said look you don't want to leave fine you stay but you have to give new life for my sisters. And, you know, until a letter comes, we used to, you know, once every month or so to get, to get a letter from my brother. Um, then he decided, he said, that's it. Uh, from today, I'm not going to write any letters until you send my sisters. So it was very difficult, you know, for my parents not to receive anything from my brother. Um, you know, there's no phones, there's no mobile, there's no emails, there's nothing. So uh, that put pressure on my parents. Now, a friend of my dad said to my uh, father, he said, look, you've been working in politics and in, in, and in journalism and all that. You have people that they know you. If they decide to refuse your application, they will refuse all the family. So I suggest that let your wife apply for a passport once she gets it she will up the the, uh, us as daughters under age we will be under her then Mm -hmm. you can physically do passports for your daughters send them and then you apply for a passport by yourself if you don't get it at least you can escape and then your wife goes by passport if you get the passport good luck you can go by passport and this is exactly what happened my mom applied. Once she got the okay, she made a passport for us. I still have a copy of the passport. I, you know, I cherish it. It's my last uh, documentation that I'm Iraqi. Um, and uh, uh, he uh, and and they send us now to send us again. We're underage. We we didn't go out of our house by ourselves. We always had escorts. You know, either either my parents or my cousins or this. So how to send us on a on a flight to Turkey by ourselves? So my mom said, "Okay, I've got the passport, but I'm not letting them go on the airplane if I don't know somebody is receiving them on the other end in Istanbul." So uh, my fa- my brother left his studies. Uh, he was a student. He didn't have money, so he borrowed. He took a loan. Uh, brought uh, bought a pass um, bought a ticket and he met us in Istanbul we stayed for three days he um, sent us to to Israel and then from there he went back to uh, to uh, uh, to his studies so um, it it was it was uh, it wasn't smooth it's not you know some people it's very difficult if you don't go through this you don't know for for somebody in britain applying for a passport fill a form somebody signs and that's it it was just like a call it as a documentation from freedom from prison it's you know only with this you can save your life i'm gonna now jump forward to today um you are an activist you're very active online you're very active on social media um, promoting the knowledge of iraqi jewish history 
Um, can you tell us about your work and what motivates you to continue with it? Okay, oh, it's a big thing. Um, first of all, I think that anyone who speaks Arabic has a duty speak Arabic and lived in Iraq and lived in any other country, have the duty to document these things, document the history, document their memories, and try to build bridges with people who don't know anything about the Jews. Um, we, are, we are a chapter that it's been closed and nobody know anything. Uh, I have been trying through uh, Facebook and through my YouTube channel to try to present what was hidden from the Iraqis. I mean, my, my audience, I mean, I, I, I get contacted by a lot of people. My, my audience is Iraqis and it's very important for me to re-establish uh, this history so people can, um, can rely on the information that I'm giving. Now, what I'm doing on Facebook, I am active. I've got my page and I am an administrator in, in a group called Jews of Iraq, uh, where I write my own posts or you know, be responsible on, on answering questions. But with the YouTube channel, it started from nothing, but now it became one of the main projects that I work on. And it is documenting memoirs of people in Israel talking about their lives, um, I'm trying to concentrate on people who um, everyone thinks that that all the Jews lived in Baghdad. Jews lived everywhere in Iraq, from the north to the south, from the east to west. So what I'm trying to do now, every time I go to Israel, I meet, unfortunately, they are elderly people and not all of them will remember or want to be recorded. Um, and, and talk about the, the memories in, in the city. And the, the, um, the response from, from Iraq, from Iraqis is overwhelming, is literally overwhelming. I, before I go to sleep, it's just like my prayer. I just go on YouTube and see the messages. And it's, it is heartwarming, really. Um, people are thanking me, and I'm not, it's not me, it's thanking me for exposing this history which was hidden i mean nahla probably can can confirm nahla from baghdad can confirm how the response of people um i, I get i get uh, people who are requesting i'm mean, uh, requesting can you do interview with somebody from this and this city can you do interview with this and this and they and actually with these videos uh, some people found their friends through these videos. If I interview somebody called Fuad and he mentioned a few people and I insist to ask them if they remember any of their childhood friendship, you know, friends from school or from neighbors and all that. And people actually contact me through, through YouTube or through Facebook and say, I am the son of this and this that Fuad mentioned. And people are calling each other. And it's just like, that's a bridge. And it's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Because then people will remember, yes, my dad used to say this, and my mom was just, used to say this. It's bringing, bringing people together. And I, tis, I think it's very important. Thank you. So, so that, that's much. only two of my projects. I've got other projects. I know you've got loads of projects, but I'm gonna um, I'm gonna stop asking you questions now, and I'm going to ask you some questions that I've been sent uh, from from people. Um, so they've messaged me privately, so I'm not going to read out their names. I'll just ask you their questions. Okay. The first one is: To what extent do you think that class privilege may have played a role in your family not experiencing as much anti-Semitism in everyday life? Because this questioner's experience was quite different. I personally don't think it has to do anything to do with class. Um, look, there's some people who are similar class as us, and they were attacked. So you don't know. Uh, I don't think class has to do with it, really, to be honest with you. Not from my experience. And um, there's another question. Um, 
Have you heard of any radio broadcasts calling for Iraqi Jews to return to Iraq? Uh, radio broadcasts, no, but there are people. I mean, there is a, one of the um, very, I would say, important person who is a um, um, big part of the uh, Iraqi political system called Muqtada Sadr. Twice he said, you know, the Jews are welcomed and all this, but, and people were excited about it. Uh, but you need to see between the lines. What he said at the bottom is only if their loyalty is to Iraq. Now, I'm Iraqi, whether he likes it or not. Uh, I, don't accept, I don't accept any conditions. It's either I'm Iraqi or I'm not. This question is not given to any Iraqi. So why should it be given to me? There is not broadcast. It's, it's uh, I would say, individuals who are, I mean, I can see it on Facebook as well, or on, yeah, we want you back, we want you back. It's not the individual. It's the whole system needs to, to accept the Jews and not to accept, sorry, it's, it's the wrong word. It's not to accept it. It's to um, uh, admit that the Jews are part or were part of the Iraqi society. If you don't accept it, if you don't admit it, then I will always stay sort of somebody who's, they did me a favor. I don't want any favors, thank God. I've got my, uh, I've got a Britain here who gave me a refuge. I've got Israel, I don't need it. It's not a favor. Nahla, you like what I'm saying. I'm pretty sure Nahla will like. <laughs> you can't, we can't hear you in a minute. <laughs> um, you. Yeah, I'll ask the questions that I've got written first and then I'll open up to um, video questions. Yeah. Um, the next question is, um, how are you educating Iraqi diaspora and Iraqi youth on Jewish history? And how can uh, Arab allies help you with that, except not through Facebook? in any other way, I think it means in, in real terms, I'm, I think. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure Arab, it means here non-Jews. That's what it says, I'm reading yeah. the question. <laughs> yeah, 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 but I'm, I, I think this is what it meant. So what I'm doing is through my YouTube channel, I'm educating a lot of people. It's, it's really, it's an education uh, project. What I do as well is I've got a forum, a cultural forum that I have here in, the, in, in London, where I do events. The events are not 100% about the Jews, but there are a lot of Jews, uh, you know, Jewish subjects about it, uh, you know, we, we introduce. Uh, I sell books uh, about, uh, mainly about Jews, uh, whether um, I bring from Israel, in Arabic and in English, or I bring from Baghdad. Uh, um, through the Facebook, I put my posts. Now, the other thing is, just recently I started working in an Arabic TV here in London, and I've got my own show. It's a chat show. Now, this again is not, it's not specifically about the Jews, it is about Iraq. So the Jews will be part of it somehow. I don't want to dedicate everything about the Jews. I want exactly what I'm expecting. I want the Jews to be part of Iraq. So, you know, there's many ways. I talk to a lot of people. I discuss a lot of things about people. I've got, you know, I'm in groups on WhatsApp with, you know, media people, Iraqi media people. Uh, and when there is any question or there is any, uh, um, you know, uh, points about the Jews, I, you know, I, I give them the information. I love giving information. I'm very proud of my Judaism. Um, there are two questions I'm going to put together because they're quite similar. Um, what is it like visiting Israel? And what are your thoughts about the current diplomatic relations or lack of diplomatic relations between Israel and Iraq and are you hopeful for the future in this regard? It's a big um, question if you don't want to answer you. Yeah, no, 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 no problem, no problem. Israel, look, Israel, uh, when I left Iraq, I, I lived in Israel uh, 
and all my family. I have no one apart from um, third cousin here. I have no one here uh, and, and my children, but I have no one. The rest, the majority, 95% are in Israel. I go and visit once a year and this is my second home. Um, you know, Israel is very important and Israel is, uh, is the country that opened a door to the Jews when they were, when they left Iraq. No other country apart from, you know, some people who had contacts in the UK or in other places, but the majority, the, the, uh, the quantity of, of people who left Iraq, only Israel accepted them. So Israel is very important for me and to, I think, for every, every Jew, I assume. Um, the future, look, uh, let's be honest. While Iran is controlling Iraq, there is no future, not for the Jews and not for, the, for Iraq. Um, I think the Iraqis are ready if they have the if the um, if the rope is taken out from their neck they are ready to accept or to um, um, think that the jews are part i think i might be wrong i would hope if there is anyone here apart from nahla from baghdad uh, if they can confirm what i what i think there is a lot of people who realized who were the Jews, what did they do for Iraq, and how important their, um, uh, their position in the Iraqi, uh, how shall I say it, tapestry. Um, but, you know, while, while Iran, Iraq is under the, the thumb of Iran, as I said, no hope for this and no hope for the Iraqis either. Thank you. Um, can you repeat the name of your father's book and tell us where we can get hold of it? Well, yes. Buy it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, uh, my father's book is called Al Jawahari Bilisanihi Wa Qalami. It means Al Jawahari with his voice or tongue. The, the literally, literally um, uh, translation is with his tongue and my pen, which means with his talking and my writing and and you can get it through me i sell the books i'll just um, you know if you allow me i'll just show you in a moment that's my library and i sell the books so anyone who is interested the majority of books are in arabic but i have few english ones anyone um you know can contact uh, daisy or bear you know, they can give my telephone number or my email address and, you know, I will post it or ship it or, yeah. Um, could you, I'm going to open it up now um, to questions from people. I'm, I'm going to just unmute the people who have got their hands up digitally and then I'll go to real hands up. In a minute. <laughs> so first, uh, Rosalind Shoga. Shoga. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Yes. Go ahead, Rosalind. Uh, hello. Uh, wonderful to hear you. Too. And I was Thank wondering, you. these um, media people that you're associated with from Iraq, um, what is their response, or what has been their response, of finding out about you and the fact that there are uh, there were many, many Jews for 3,000 years in Iraq. Are they aware of this or is this something new to them that you're teaching yes. them? Yes, um, there are actually uh, the, I would say 90% or even more of the reaction is very, very positive. Um, and is it's not just... Is this just... they knew already? Do Sorry? they know that? Did they know this information before they met A lot you? of people know vaguely, but they don't know specifically. For example, you know, I did an interview with um, somebody from a certain city in, in, in Iraq. It's called the Nasriya. A lot of people 
I think it gives them an excuse to dig in their memory. Um, and this is what I want. I want to trigger their memory on things. So they will say, oh, actually, my dad was telling me about this Jew who was this, who was a, who was a um, goldsmith or who was, uh, uh, he had uh, this, this uh, business or that business. I want to trigger, I want somebody just to scratch their head and say, let me dig the information. A lot of people don't know but this triggers them to go and find. So what they do, and if somebody says something, I say, go and speak to the elderly people to confirm that I'm not just making it up. And what I want them, I want them to, I want to encourage them to go and research because there's no point of me spoon feeding them. I want them to go and research. So very positive. And as I said, for me, it's like a prayer before I go to sleep. I have my mobile and I check the messages on YouTube and, you know, it really, really very, very, um, you know, overwhelming. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Aram, I'm going to unmute you now. Thank you. Can you Go ahead. Me? Hi, Aram. Hi. Can you hear me at all? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much to you all. Um, and thank you to Niran for letting me know about this too. Um, so my background is I am actually from Iraq, um, from Hilla in Iraq. Um, Shia Muslim. Um, but I, I knew of the Jewish um, population that lived in Iraq through my father, but I didn't know much about them. And thankfully through Niran, I've, I've you know, a whole treasure treasure chest of, of information regarding the Jewish um, population. Now some, something that uh, Niran picked up on um, about how Iraqis feel about uh, the Jewish population in Iraq and I can say from my own circles here in London, in Birmingham, um, from our Iraqi centres and communities is that we wholeheartedly would love for the Jewish community to return. Um, not just the Jewish community but the Christians that have had to leave in recent times. Um, Iraq was on the foundation was built on the Jewish knowledge and the Jewish, not just knowledge, but also their expertise and their mysticism and their spirituality and in the Christian as well as the Muslim. And so wholehearted, I can say from everyone that I know, um, politically, it's a different story. And that's the trouble. Uh, politically, we have too many hands in Iraq. Um, it's not Iraqi politics. Um, we have too many uh, actors that have got their hands in Iraq, whether it's politics or economic, um, so realistically, it's going to be difficult, um, but hand on heart, we can't wait to see uh, Jewish communities return one day to Iraq, as well as, as all the other communities that have had to leave in recent time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Al Atar, you had, did you have a question? I'm here. Hi, <laughs> hi Ayala. Uh, hi, uh, uh, Niran. Just a quick question, or yeah, a question. When you mentioned the um, 1967 war, and you said that you felt differently after that, uh, it doesn't matter whether the treatment is different after that, or or you felt that way. But it's difficult for a person to just feel that way without the how would I put it without the uh, uh, the history behind it, meaning that, let me put it this way, how much of the treatment of the Jews in Iraq uh, uh, was unfair but hidden and uh, stayed there? And the reason I say this is because my experience is very similar, uh, because I'm from Irania, um, Iranian ancestry, but I always uh, sort of felt I'm an alien there because of the, um, you know, not, not the sense of belonging there. It's not because I know uh, uh, anything about my Iranian ancestors. I never knew what Iran was. I was born there, my dad and my granddad. But prior to 1967, uh, it, I know that you said, you said that the treatment was okay, but you cannot just feel that way after the war. Uh, I don't know if I'm, sort of making the point clear to you or not? Um, well, I, I, I can only talk about, don't forget, I was 10 years old when this happened. Yeah, 
Indeed. Until the te 10 years old, you know, what do you do? You, you, you play at school and you come back home. It's normal life and all this. I didn't know I had a big family and suddenly disappeared. I grew up, you know, knowing that I've got three cousins and, you know, a second cousin and, 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 and that's it. So it wasn't, it, it, there was no difference. You know, um, since I realized who I am until the age of 10, it was flat and suddenly it changed. This is what I'm saying, you know, I didn't feel anything until that, that changed me because we were hiding in a way to try to listen to news. So you are different. Why do we need to hide? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the reason I said this, the reason I say this is that because I felt, for example, that the Iraqis, they call us Ajan, because we did not really, uh, so we have Iranian ancestors, although we, we, I was born, my dad was born in Iraq, but uh, to get it close, I mean, did you feel or your parents, uh, the label of Jews as a negative sort of, has a negative connotation? I mean, in our case, uh, it's different, I suppose. No, I, I mean, no, uh, as far as I know, um, uh, no, especially with my, my father. I mean, they used to joke, look, they used to joke sometimes. They used to call, they used to say to my dad, say, it's a shame you are Jew. Okay. So, you know what? My, my mom once, I remember once uh, she, uh, my brother had a friend, very lovely guy. And she said, oh, it's a shame he's not a Jew. I would have married you, one of you, you or sister you, or your sister to him. So I don't take it negatively, okay? Um, but, you know, it said, my, it just went across my dad. It didn't bother him. It wasn't, he wasn't targeted as such because he was a Jew. I'm going to just move on. Thank you, Alata. Um, I'm going to go to the last two questions. The first one, uh, Emil Cohen. I'm gonna unmute you now. I was gonna say something about returning, uh, Iraqi Jews returning to Iraq. I honestly don't think that is on at all. For one simple reason, there's always total lack of confidence in the people. Always that doubt. No matter how good they are at the moment, no matter how loving they are at the moment, there's always that doubt that one day they will turn against us again. It doesn't matter when, it will always happen. And I mean, even now we see it, despite the fact, Miran, that you've got plenty of groupings and, and uh, you're well favored there, etc. But I always worry that sometime or other they would turn against. And that's why I don't think people would go back at all. Thank you. Thank you, Emil. Um, and then the last question is Elliot Sinclair. Yeah, hi. Uh, you are unmuted, go ahead. Hi there. Um, hi. Yeah, heard, um, music really brought families together in Iraq and um, was like a source of celebration. Sorry, can you repeat that? Sorry. Yes, and um, from what I heard, music in Iraq uh, really brought families together and um, you know, in the mitzvahs and weddings and it was, it was played a lot in parties. On, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Continuation of that kind of musical culture in London now, you know, are there any places to go to hear it? Well, uh, Iraqi, Iraqi music, you mean, yeah. or Arabic yeah, or, music? Yeah, or Iraqi music or Iraqi Jewish music or anything like that. Well, Iraqi Jewish music, there isn't there isn't uh, an Iraqi Jewish music as such. There's Iraqi music. And there are a few songs which are mainly M M Muslawi. As I said, it's the same dialect. It's between Muslawi and between Jewish, only few. But it is Iraqi, Iraqi music. Now, look, there, there are sometimes, there are, uh, as we call it, hafla. Um, some people do uh, parties in restaurants, uh, do concerts. Uh, do events there are some some but recently I haven't heard of anything um, if you would like uh, I don't know if you if you know we can take my telephone number from um, from Bear or from uh, Daisy um, I can add you on on my list on 
you know, on my WhatsApp groups and, and send you if there is anything. But, but just to add something, when I lived in, in Iraq, the congregation was so small, you would not believe I haven't been to a bar mitzvah and I haven't been to a wedding. Because um, either I was too young or they would do the bar mitzvah in a very small, it wasn't as like here doing it in a hall and all this. We were a small congregation. So some people say, oh yeah, you know, when the wedding scene is in Iraq, I've never been to a wedding, I've never been to a bar mitzvah, so I can't compare. Um, thank, and you. We, thank you. Uh, we've got a presentation that we'll be sharing um, tomorrow as well that we did at the JMI um, about Yeheskel Kojiman, who is a, a musicologist, a Iraqi musicologist, and he talks about the um, Jewish musicians in Iraq as well. So there's some information as well there and, and on the JMI website, the Jewish Music Institute. Uh, I'm going to just say thank you very, very much to Niran now. Um, and I'm going to unmute all of you so that okay. if you would like to just say thank you, you can do so. Thank you, Niran. Thank you. Thank you. Very informative. It was lovely, really interesting. Very, if you need to go and you uh, want to go then that's fine and then I've got a couple more questions if you want to say Niran are you okay to take yeah one? yeah yeah well, with, all, with all with pleasure okay so if it, I will um Amy would you um like to ask your question hi thank you so much for your talk um hi Amy hi I just wondered in terms of like I was just thinking about trans culture and how you really moved across and through all these different cultures, Iraqi Jewish, you know, Iraqi, British Jewish, Israeli Jewish. I just wondered if you could talk more about all the cultural influences on your life. Sorry, how did it influence my life? Yeah, just go moving through all these different cultures. Yeah, to be honest with you, at the moment, I can't really say that I am into the uh, uh, British culture. I mean, I, 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 I was raised on British music as well and all this, and American and French and all this. But it's, at the moment, you know, because of my work and all that, it's more concentrating on the Arabic music, mainly Iraqi, and the culture, and the Jewish, Israeli. So, um, and, um, and I find that, you know, they connect somehow. Um, what I, very important for me is to introduce this one to this one and this one to this one. I, I, I feel like a bridge and yeah. I'm not only focusing on the Iraqis, I'm focusing on both. It's very, it's very, hi Michal. I just discovered Michal. Um, I, I want to focus on both because there is um, uh, misinformation from both sides. Um, and because I speak both languages and because I know both cultures, um, I can be the bridge. So for example, um, on, on the Facebook page that I, you know, I'm one of the admins there. Um, and again, even with these little thing, you know, a Facebook page, I've got, uh, we are four administrators, one uh, in Israel, Jewish, one in London Muslim, and one in Baghdad Muslim. It's, you know, so what I do, for example, I will take uh, Adon Olam, you know, the part of our service in the morning uh, on Shabbat, on, on Saturday, and I translate it to Arabic. So, you know, they suddenly see, oh, yeah, you know, it's beautiful. You know, this is this is what you say on on Shabbat, yes. Or, for example, I take the first part of the Shema and translate it to Arabic. Um, what I'm I I really concentrate is mainly on the on the festivals. I write a post about each festival or our festivals and how we celebrate it and why we celebrate it, and this way. Again, this is what I'm saying. I want them to scratch their head and try to find the information. And somebody, I will, I will write about Sukkot, how they yeah. do the Sukkah and all this. And somebody, I remember, and I say, I say, I write the way it was uh, uh, pronounced in in Iraq. So somebody says to me, so for example, in Iraq, when it's Sukkot, it's known 
that the first rain will start. Is that right, Nahla? Nahla will confirm it to me. Everyone knows. I don't Dira, know if, if they allow me, I have to come. Just, just one moment, just one moment, just one moment. So, so the first rain starts in Sukkot. And I, I put it in the post. I say, and my dad used to be asked in the street, when is going to be your festival called the Arazil, which is, which is Sukkot? And I wrote it in this post. Somebody wrote to, he said to me, you know what? My mom used to say that. There is a festival, Jewish festival. We know that we used to know when the rain used to start. So it triggered and he searched for this information and through this, he will go and search. So, you know, you can find tiny little things and, and build on it something. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if uh, Nahla is allowed to, to say something. Daisy? Yes, of course. <laughs> She's from Baghdad. She's my friend from Baghdad. Of course she is. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, Niran, if I fail to express something in English, just help me. This is my first experience to talk in English. Yeah. Nahla teaches yes. English in Baghdad. Teaching Arabic for foreign people. Arabic for English. <laughs> <laughs> PhD in Arabic. Okay. Uh, one comment about if the Jewish want to return to Baghdad or not. This is, I think, this is a very personal issue. But they have the right. We should talk about their right, a political Absolutely. issue, their right. Because maybe Muslim, maybe Shia, Sunni, they are emigrate out and they don't want to return. This is a personal issue, I, I believe. Okay. So, uh, we should talk about the politic. And one question I hear it from, I think, Rosa, a, a friend with us here, uh, asking if the Iraqi people know about the uh, Jewish uh, people. It is a generations issue. Uh, I was born in 1967. Uh, our generation, during the past regime, we whispered between each other, talking about the Jewish song, the Imarat uh, al buildings, Jewish everywhere. And actually, how I met Niran, I feel I have a nostalgia, if I can use this term. Uh, nostalgia, for the yeah. Point. Yeah, I try to, I focus on, uh, I am Arabic teacher. I, uh, my research uh, focus on uh, Iraqi women autobiography. Suddenly I discovered, and I missed, there is a gap in the history, so, social history. Then I tell myself, look, Nahla, the first, uh, first community, the women have an opportunity to, to, start, uh, to, to, to know, read or write, it is the Jewish community. That means I should expect uh, an autobiography from them. So where is it? Where are they? That's how lead me to search on it. Then I discovered the second generation, Iraqi generation in Israel, wrote their autobiography. This is the way that I connect to, to Iran when I came to London. And she bring me good books, but for men, yes. which wrote by the Iraqi Academy. I just want to say that you say just that she is a bridge to break misunderstand. Actually, there is a generation, there is a, a, a lot of people thirsty to hear about them. When I saw Niran first time, I hold her and I cry. That's right. I haven't met, yeah, it is part of my, of my body. Okay, and we believe that in peace will be in Iraq if we are peace with every, all Iraqi people. Actually, we have problem in the beginning with the Jewish, then with the, with the Christian. Christianity, then with the Izidi. And right. yeah, this, this make Iraq uh, weak. We need the peace by social, uh, we, we should accept each other, I don't talk this as a propaganda, she know it Iran, uh, in Iran. Uh, actually a lot of us go to find their Athar, Iran, Atharkom. Yeah, their archaeology, their archaeology and their existence, you know. Uh, your proof touch, uh, your touch everywhere. So يعني, we, we are thirsty to hear. When Iran came on YouTube, uh, it became a public figure. 
<laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nana. Thank you, Habibti. Okay, I don't want to take more. Uh, I, I just want to add last, I mean, I just want to add something. I don't know if last thing I'm ready to talk another half an hour. I have no problem. Uh, as I said to Desi, if you have to ask me questions, otherwise I'll talk from now till next week. Um, what I want to say, um, I'm not saying that the Jews are going back to Iraq. A lot of people misunderstand me. And it's actually Nahla, I'm thanking Nahla now to, to uh, you know, to direct me. We want to know, we want to establish that the Jews have the right, like anyone else. Like, uh, where is Allah? I don't know if he's still here. Allah can go back to Iraq. He lost his, he lost his um, uh, uh, Iraqi uh, citizenship because he is, his ancestors are Iranian, okay? But he could go to Iraq and regain his uh, um, citizenship. I can't. Now, this is my right. I don't want, and now a lot of people ask me, say, uh, would you come back to Iraq? That's not the question. Give me my nationality back. I'll decide, there are a lot of people, I know a lot of people living in, in, in the UK for the last 60 years, they've never been back to Iraq. Give me, you know what? I'm not gonna do anything with it. I'm, I don't think I will be still alive when this will, will be given. But I want to establish the right. And to be honest with you, let's be honest, 100%. I don't think the Jews will go back. But I want to have the right to have this nationality and to have the right to go and visit and to have the right to be given to my children if ever there will be peace in, in Iraq. I'm entitled. I was, it was taken away from me. In, with power, I want it back. I will not do anything with it. And I said it to Nahla and I said it to a few friends. I will put it in a frame and hang it. This is none of anyone's business what I do with it. I want it back. That's my right. So I'm not taking anyone with me to Iraq. I'm not moving to Iraq, but I want to establish that this is, this is my right. Mm -hmm.